We are live from the Gov 2.0 Expo in Washington, D.C., and I am joined this morning by Jeff Carr, founder and CEO of Greylogic and author of Inside Cyber Warfare. Thank you very much for being with us. My pleasure. Really appreciate it. Uh, so first question I have for you, Gov 2.0, one of the founding tenets of it is about openness. And security is sort of the reverse of that. What do you make of the push and pull between those two things? Is the security threat and sort of the mission critical nature of government work, uh, is that going to undermine some of the openness that Gov 2.0 is pushing for? I think the realization is that you cannot be fully open. I mean, that clearly you have to understand the, what I think the, the key is to understand where the where is the value to an adversary, you know? So it's not what's necessarily valuable to you, but what's valuable to someone who wants to take it. And that's the information that you need to be more careful about sharing. Mm -hmm. um, other than that, I, I'm in favor of openness and accessibility to data. Right. I just I think it needs to be done in a more balanced, moderated, you know, and, uh, and, and thoughtful way. Right. So picking up on that, how can organizations, government organizations, for this audience, how, how can they realistically assess the threat? What, what, what's the checklist that they should go through? Well, unfortunately, um, for most government organizations, they are targeted the very fact that they're a government organization. Um, so the, if, if on the other hand, the, if you're part of the Department of Defense, or if you're part of the Department of Justice, or the Department of Transportation, or the Department of Energy, if, you're in, if in some way your department is dealing with matters of critical infrastructure, or intelligence, or law enforcement, then it, clearly that's you know much more serious, and you have to be much more careful about what's available um, than maybe perhaps uh, you know health and health and human services or one of the other agencies. Mm -hmm. that, you know can be more transparent. Sure. Uh, what what we do is try to look at uh, you know what are the key technologies that are of interest to the People's Republic of China or to the Russian Federation or to um, Iran or Turkey. Uh, because if you can, if you understand what's key in there uh, for that nation, then that helps guide you to what is uh, going to be valuable in terms of a target. Right. You know, and and so that's the approach that, that Gray Logic you know recommends you typically mm -hmm. um, for our for our uh, the people that we consult for. Right. Now a lot of the the issues around cybersecurity, cyber warfare, the discussions invariably turn into almost apocalyptic uh, scenarios. Um, but is that the conversation we really should be having? I mean, what, what is the real threat that we should be examining? Yeah, I, and I'm, it's very disappointing for me anytime I hear someone who I know understands the threat but uh, chooses to, um, you know, sort of paint a picture of an apoc apocalyptic end result. I, that's, it's it's uh, disheartening because you, what happens is there are many critics to cybersecurity that, that there really is no threat. And so when someone like Richard Clark or, or Admiral uh, McMullen talks about, you know, planes falling out of the sky or, you know, the whole country losing power, whatever it might be, um, a critic will look at that and say, well, it's ridiculous. Mm. Therefore, there is no threat, right? So, um, my, so my view is that there, the, the more serious threat is that the, our opponents, or when I say our opponents, I mean those people who are, see value in taking what is not theirs, um, prefer to operate on a, on a low level, uh, 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 to below what's, what's called a red line. You know, they don't want to trigger a response. They just want to be considered, if anything, you know, a cost of doing business. Mm -hmm. And in fact, uh, from the financial sector, that's how they look at it. If, if a bank is losing 20% of its, uh, of its uh, income due to theft by uh, cyber criminals, that's the cost of doing business. They're okay with that, right. because if they, if on the other hand they were to have to harden their networks, they'd lose money. Huh. You know, so that, uh, so where is the profit in hardening their network? Right. You know, there, there is none, and therefore it's not done. Uh, and and that's why I, I would prefer that more attention be focused on that strategy. That it's we are not looking at some powerful enemy. We're looking at a very subtle operating just below the radar drain of financial and intellectual and uh, and um, national security type of, of data, you know, that will be taken out very patiently, gradually, huh. um, so hopefully it will never be detected, or it'll be considered, well, you know, we can live with that loss. 
Interesting. Uh, oh. um, now, a lot of government agencies are considering moving at least some of their resources to the cloud. Recovery.gov is moving to the cloud. Is the cloud more or less secure than what we've traditionally used? Well, I'm not an expert on cloud architecture, but uh, the, the, from what I understand and the people that I've spoken to and what I've observed, the cloud is not secure. Um, and that could, does concern me. In, in my opinion, the attacks against uh, Google and 30 other companies that happened uh, in January or December or January, um, were, they were that, it, assuming that it was China, and I think that's just an assumption, but let's say it was, uh, to say that it was being done to collect information on Chinese dissidents, I think, is just ridiculous. Honest, to be honest, mm -hmm. I, th nobody's going to go to that much effort when they can find that information in so many other easier ways. Right. Uh, what makes more sense is that this was an attack against source code or it was an attack against, well, if you look at the companies that have come forward, they're all associated with cloud technology in some way. So either they're a provider like Google, you know, uh, or they provide software that supports cloud services. Uh, that is hugely valuable uh -huh. uh, as, as we see more and more um, content being moved to the cloud. You know, so. Now, those attacks, a lot of those were done through social engineering, right? Social right. engineering and spear phishing? Right. And so can you go into that a little bit? That was the last <sighs> question I have for you. What is social engineering and how can government organizations in particular work to prevent that? So a social engineering attack, the beauty of that is that it doesn't necessarily rely on any software. It doesn't rely on any malware. Um, the, uh, you know, Twitter had a, uh, Twitter was cracked, I think, last year. Uh -huh. uh, pure social engineering attack, no malware used at all. And th that's what's so great about it as a, an attack strategy. And it uses what we all love to do, which is put our information out on Facebook, MySpace, Twitter, LinkedIn, Groupon, I mean, there's a million of them. Um, that information, but what an attacker does is he looks f for, um, if he has a target company or a target agency, he'll look for maybe go to LinkedIn and start with there. Because if you go to LinkedIn today and you plug in DEA, you'll have about 150 employees of DEA right there in front of you. And with that information, you can go out and mine social networks to gather even more mm -hmm. personal data. Once you have a good understanding of your in, of the targeted people you're after, then you construct an email, a spoofed email, um, which uh, will entice them to click on a link or open a document and you're off. Mm -hmm. um, and in fact, I, uh, in, in fact, the government, government employees are becoming more and more of a target for that, uh, for spoofed emails, where it used to be just financial institutions, mm -hmm. but now it's being directed against government and military uh, email addresses as well. So the protection is education? Is that the best line of defense? I think that the, the I think education is the first step. So you, you need to, we need to spend more time talking about, um, you know, what's being done and how it's being done. And then you just have to monitor what you put online. You, you know, I mean, I've cut back on what I do online. I, I've talked to my wife about doing the same thing. I mean, it's not easy, and especially when you have family members and children that, that live online, sure. you know, and how do you ask them to, you cannot ask them not to do it. Mm -hmm. you can, for that matter, you can't ask a government employee not to do it, because right. they're, they're going to do it. So, but, but I think with training and a moderate amount of data is okay. Mm -hmm. um, and in fact, no data is a red flag. So, <laughs> oh yeah, right. You know, right. we That'd see that target, sometimes. Right? It, exactly, exactly. Oh, we, we we run into sometimes people that have just a, a minimal amount of information on the web, and that's an immediate red flag about that individual. You know, what either either what are they hiding? Who are they working for? Um, you know, so right. Uh, so I, I think the key again is is moderation and and, and a sense of thoughtfulness about you know what you're doing online. When it comes to banking, which is a huge problem, I, I never bank online. Mm. And uh, but but if I have to, I use a virtual keyboard instead of a regular keyboard. You know, just for that. Or even better, if you have multiple computers at home, have one one box that's dedicated only for banking. No email, mm -hmm. no web traffic, just just banking, and that's right. it. So certain things, I think, common sense approaches will help greatly. Great. Well, thank you so much for taking some time to visit with us. Really appreciate it. No, oh, you're welcome. Great. My pleasure. And we will be back with more live interviews from Gov 2.0 Expo.